the Ukrainian coat of arms. The Ukrainian coat of arms was officially adopted after the fall of the Soviet Union. What's up guys and welcome back to my YouTube channel. It's Tiesh. I hope you guys are doing well. Today's video is going to be about coats of arms and the history. I will also be discussing a few coats of arms such as the Ukrainian, the South African, the British as well as the United States coats of arms. I hope you guys enjoyed today's video. Please don't forget to drop a like, comment and subscribe and let's get into this. Okay, so usually I'd actually tell you guys my inspiration behind the video idea or something that um, brought me to this video idea. So this video idea is something that I've been wanting to do for a long time and I really wanted to do it when I had more subscribers but I didn't want to sit and make a video about titles and styles because I feel like it's a bit wrong about what's happening in, in the world as of now. I feel guilty, kinda. So I said, okay, let me uh, do this video idea and then incorporate the Ukrainian coat of arms. So I'm sure most people know what's happening in the world right now, especially with what's happening in Ukraine. So I thought, okay, uh, let's talk about the Ukrainian coat of arms and the history behind it, as well as a few others. And that can be my way of contributing to the history or talking about the history of Ukraine. Because anything that that's ha what's happening in Ukraine is an ongoing situation. So making a video about what's happening or what's, or what's happened, it's kind of going to be always get incorporated into misinformation or get lost in the field of other things that's happening in the world so I was like okay let me think and let's do this instead of the titles and styles and I did film a video I won't be loud lie I did film a video but I was so nervous and so anxious in the video I kind of am right now as well uh, so I chose to reform it and do it again like now so yeah um let's get into it i'll be starting off with what is coats of arms thank you for watching uh sorry for this whole long i don't know what it is but yes righty so what is a coat of arms well a coat of arms is the distinctive heraldic bearings or a shield of a person family corporation or a country Coats of arms are the principal part of a system of identity symbols dating back to the early medieval Europe. It was used primarily to establish identity in battle. Arms have evolved to denote family descent, adoption, alliance, property ownership, and eventually profession. There is also something called the national coat of arms. A national coat of arms or a state emblem is the highest visual symbol of the state. The coat of arms is also a central part of the Great Seal, traditionally considered to be the highest emblem of the state. Absolute authority is given to every document with an impression of the Great Seal on it, as this means that it, is, that it has been approved by the head of state. I will talk more about some of these quite soon, such as the South African coat of arms and the United States State Seal. The term itself, coat of arms, describes in modern terms just the heraldic design. It originates from the description of the entire medieval chainmail surcoat garment used in a combat or preparation for the latter. You would usually wear your family's colors or emblems or the king, person or somebody you were representing in battle on your garments and that brings us to the history of the coat of arms. Alrighty, the history. So, heraldic designs came into general use among European nobility in the 12th century. Systematic heritable heraldry had developed by the beginning of the 13th century and exactly who had the right to use arms by law or social convention varied to some degree between different countries in Europe. Early heraldic designs were personal, used by individual noblemen. Arms became hereditary by the end of the 12th century in England by King Richard I. During the Third Crusade between 1889 and 1192, heraldry is the system of visual identification of rank and pedigree which developed in the European High Middle Ages, closely associated with the courtly culture of chivalry, Latin Christianity, the Crusades, feudal arist arist aristocracy, and monarchy of the time. Heraldic tradition fully developed in the 13th century and it flourished and developed during the late Middle Ages and the early modern period. Originally, coats of arms were limited to noble families and before the Middle Ages and during the late Middle Ages, heraldry then started being adopted by wealthy commoners 
and the decline of noble families started. Often, after the extinction of a noble family or a noble title, their coats of arms would become so attached to the territories or the areas that they were associated with, and this gave rise to municipal coats of arms. Western heraldry had spread beyond its core territory of Latin Christendom in the 17th century and started being adopted in the East by the Russian Empire. With colonialism, the use of heraldry spread to other continents such as the Americans and the African continent, while some concepts associated with heraldry such as nobility and monarchy have declined in favour of republicanism, in the 19th and 20th centuries heraldry as a whole continued to flourish and the art form today enjoys greater prevalence than ever in countries with strong heraldic traditions. Even elsewhere, elements inherited from heraldic traditions are frequently used in national flags and emblems around the world. Despite there being no common enforceable widespread regulation, heraldry has remained consistent across Europe, where tradition alone has governed the design and the use of the arms. Some nations such as England and Scotland still maintain the same heraldic authorities which have traditionally granted and regulated the arms for centuries and continue to do so in the present day. In England, for example, the granting of arms is and always has been controlled by the College of Arms. Coats of arms, unlike seals and other gentle ebrams, heraldic achievements have a formal description called a blazon, which uses vocabulary that allows for consistency in heraldic depictions. In the present day, coats of arms are still used in a variety of different institutions and individuals. For example, many European cities and universities have different guidelines on how their coats of arms may be used and how they are protected as trademarks, as any other unique identifier might be. Many societies still exist till this day that also aid in the design and the registration of a personal coat of arms or a personal heraldic design. Alrighty, let's talk about what a coat of arms is made of. The basic coat of arms consists of a helmet of a knight and that can be topped with a crown or a family crest. Then there are two supporters on either side of what is a shield that contains the family's colours or symbol. It also has a motto underneath and that is just the basics of a coat of arms. Many, there are many different versions and variants of coats of arms all around the world and I will be discussing a few of them right now. I will be discussing the Republic of South Africa's coat of arms as well as the Queen of the United Kingdoms, the United States State Seal as well as the Ukrainian coat of arms. Alrighty, let's talk about the coat of arms of the Republic of South Africa. The current coat of arms was adopted on Freedom Day in the year 2000. Previously, we had a coat of arms which was used by the Union of South Africa and then the Republic of South Africa from the year 1910 until the year 2000. It was decided that a coat of arms was needed to accurately represent the new South Africa after the fall of the apartheid government in 1994. Let's talk about or let's move on to the design of the coat of arms and let's start from the bottom. The bottom contains the first element which is the motto in a green semicircle. Completing the semicircle are two symmetrical placed pairs of elephant tusks pointing upward. Within the oval shape formed by the tusks are two symmetrical ears of wheat that in turn frame a centrally placed gold shield. The shape of the shield makes stiff reference to the drum and contains two figures derived from Khoisan rock art. The figures are depicted facing one another in greeting and in unity. Above the shield are a spear and a knob kiri crossed in a single unit. These elements are arranged harmoniously to give focus to the shield and complete the lower oval shape of the foundation. And the top part of the coat of arms you'll see immediately above the oval shape of the foundation is the visual center of the coat of arms, a protea. The petals of the protea are rendered in a triangular pattern in reminiscent of the crafts of Africa. The secretary bird is placed above the protea and the flower forms the chest of the bird. The secretary bird stands with its wings lifted upward in a regal uprising gesture. The distinctive head feathers of the secretary bird crown a strong vigilant head. The rising sun above the horizon is placed between the wings of the secretary bird and completes the oval shape of ascendance. The combination of the upper and lower oval shapes intersects to form an unbroken infinite course. And the great harmony between the basic elements result in a dynamic, elegant and thoroughly distinctive design. 
yet it clearly retains the stability and gravity and immediacy that, that a coat of arms demands and all of these symbols have different and varied meanings all across South Africa from Limpopo to Cape Town. Alrighty, that was the South African coat of arms which has been in South Africa from the year 2000 until present day. Now let's move on to the Ukrainian coat of arms. The Ukrainian coat of arms was officially adopted after the fall of the Soviet Union and a couple of years after the creation of the independent Ukraine. The coat of arms of Ukraine is a blue shield with a gold trident, officially referred to as the princely state symbol of Vladimir the Great, or colloquially as the Trizip. The insignia derives from the steel of the trident of Vladimir the first Grand Prince of Kiev. Volya is the Ukrainian word for freedom and these Cyrillic letters of the word Volya form the trident and the small coat of arms was officially adopted on the 9th of February 1992. While the constitutional provisions exist for establishing a greater coat of arms which has not been officially adopted, the small coat of arms was designed by Andrei Gretlo, Oleksky, Koken and Ivan Turetsky. It appears on the presidential standard of Ukraine. Blue colored tridents are considered to be an irregular representation of the Ukrainian heraldry society. The greater coat of arms of Ukraine was, has not been adopted but it consists of a small coat of arms and the coat of arms of Zaporizhian host. The trident was not thought of as the national symbol of Ukraine until the year 1917 when one of the most prominent Ukrainian historians proposed to adopt it as their national symbol. Alongside other variants including the obelisk, a bow or a cossack carrying a musket. Images that carried considerable historical and cultural and heraldic significance for Ukraine. On the 25th of February 1918, the Central Rada or the Ukrainian Parliament adopted it as the coat of arms of the short-lived Ukrainian People's Republic. During the Soviet period of 1919 up until 1991, the independence between 1991 and 1992, the state symbols were consistent with the Russian Soviet Republic and the Soviet Union, a hammer and sickle over the rising sun. And that was the Ukrainian lookout of arms. There wasn't much information and there was also a lot of information. So it was a bit hard to pick from different parts of the uh, page and try to piece together a good uh, part of the script. So I just spoke and put in what I can, the key points. Now we will be talking about the Royal Coat of Arms of the United Kingdom or the Queen's Coat of Arms of the United Kingdom. Let's start off with why is the Coat of Arms of Scotland and why is the Coat of Arms of England, Wales and Northern Ireland completely different? The Royal Arms of Scotland is the official Coat of Arms of the King of Scots, first adopted in the 12th century because of the Union of the Crowns. In 1603, James VI inherited the thrones of England and Ireland and thus his arms in Scotland were now quartered with the arms of England, which itself was quartered with the arms of France, with an additional quarter for Ireland also added to the arms, which changed in due time. Though the kingdoms of England and Scotland would share the same monarch, the distinction in heraldry used in both kingdoms was maintained. When the kingdoms of Scotland and England were united under the Acts of Union in 1707 to form the Kingdom of Great Britain, no single arms were created, thereby maintaining the convention that the royal arms used in Scotland would continue to differ from those used elsewhere. This is the royal arms of Scotland adopted in 1952, with some changes made to the Harp of Ireland, which was also changed in the rest of the kingdom's coats of arms. The Royal Coat of Arms of the United Kingdom of Wales, England and Northern Ireland, or the Royal Arms for short, is the arms of the dominion of the British monarch, currently Queen Elizabeth II. These arms are used by the Queen in her official capacity as monarch of the United Kingdom. Variants of the Royal Arms are used by members of the British royal family and by the British government. The arms in banner form serve as basis for the monarch's official flag, the Royal Standard. In the standard variant used outside of Scotland, the shield is quartered depicting the first and fourth quarters as the three peasant guarded lines of England, and in the second, the rampant line and double treasury flurry, counter flurry of Scotland, and in the third quarter, the harp for Ireland. The crest is a statant guarded lion wearing St. Edward's crown, himself on another representation of that crown. The Dexter supporter is a likewise crowned English lion, the sinister a Scottish unicorn. 
the English and Scottish quarters and supporters are swapped in the Scottish version of the arm. In the greenery below the coat of arms is a thistle, a Tudor rose and a shamrock depicting and representing Scotland, England and Ireland respectively. The armorial achievement comprises the motto which is in French but I'll read it in English, God and my right which has descended to the present royal family as well as the garter circlet which surrounds the shield inscribing the order's motto in French as well but I'll read it in English, shame on him who thinks evil of it. In the arms as used in Scotland, the order of the thistle's motto, no one provokes me with impunity is used. And that, ladies and gents, was the coat of arms of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, as well as Queen Elizabeth II's coat of arms. Now, let's talk about the coat of arms of the United States or the United States State Steel. The current coat of arms, which was decided upon through three committees with different designs and different elements, were brought in to bring the final design into light. On June 13, 1782, the Congress turned to its secretary, Charles Thompson, and provided all material submitted by the first three committees. Thompson was 53 years old and had been a Latin master at a Philadelphia academy. Thompson took elements from all three previous committees coming up with a new design which provided the basis for the final state seal we see today. Thompson used the eagle this time specifying an American bald eagle as the sole supporter on the shield. The shield had 13 stripes this time in a chevron pattern and the eagle's claws held an olive branch and a bundle of 13 arrows. For the crest he used Hopkinson's constellation of 13 the motto of the United States State Seal was E Pluribus Una, taken from the first committee and that was on a scroll held in the eagle's beak. An eagle holding symbols of war and peace has a long history and also echoed the second committee's themes. The arrows also mirror those in the arms of the Dutch Republic, the only other country in Europe with a representative government at the time which depicted a lion holding seven arrows representing their seven provinces. Thompson essentially kept the first proposed design but re-added a triangle around the Eye of Providence and, ne and changed the mottos to a nit subtus and novus ordus seclorum. Thompson returned the designs to a person named Barton, who was a master heraldic designer who made some final alterations and the stripes on the shield were changed, this time to be vertical and the eagle's wings were positioned and were changed to be displayed upward instead of rising. The design was submitted to Congress on the 20th of June 1782 and was accepted the same day. Thompson included a page of explanatory notes of the seal but no drawing was submitted. Alrighty guys, that was the last coat of arms and that was the United States State Seal. Now before I end up this video, I actually just want to mention two coats of arms that I find really cool actually. So I didn't know the first one existed, I knew about the second one, but the first one I didn't know existed. And this is the coat of arms of Nelson Mandela, the former president of South Africa and the first black president of South Africa. And he became president of the Free South Africa in 1994 after the abolishment of apartheid. And the next coat of arms I want to mention is the Dukes of Norfolk. The Dukes of Norfolk are all marshals and they help in preparations for the coronation of the next British monarch and they've been doing it for centuries. And that is it. Thank you guys for watching. I do hope you guys enjoyed the video. Please don't forget to drop a like, comment and subscribe. Also check out all my social medias, links are in the description box down below as well as a couple of links to a couple of charities for Ukraine if you guys want to check those out and donate or maybe read about what's happening as well. Thank you and I shall see you guys in the next one. Bye bye.